Kevin and Hosanna, and welcome to your Sunday Connection. The Kids Out Loud Community Rewards Fundraiser had seven households participate in the last quarter, and we raised $51. So far this quarter, we have 20 households participating and have already raised $115. If you haven't signed up yet, please pick up a form at any of the offering stations or the Kids Out Loud check-in kiosk and support the children's ministry. Brother Bowen asked us to remind you that you can also support the youth ministry by signing up with Amazon Smile, and a portion of all your Amazon purchases will go toward the youth ministry. Information on this easy means of supporting your youth ministry can be found at the information booth in the front foyer. Okay, men, next Sunday, June the 12th, is our father-son friend outdoor extravaganza at beautiful Lake Carvin in the charming resort town of Enon, Mississippi. Plenty of food and manly activities, fishing tournaments, shooting competitions, lots of fun for everyone. Directions will be posted in the foyer, and start time is 3 p.m., and we will go until it's too dark to fish or shoot. Make your plans now. While we're still on manly topics, we still need he men for the Soul Patrol parking team. You can also sign up in the front foyer. Just remember moms and dads, all young ladies in the Kids Out Loud need to wear shorts underneath their dresses due to all the playing on our bouncies. The tithe is 10% of your gross income and it should be given to God faithfully. In Proverbs 3.9 it says that you must honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Paying the tithe is something every Christian should do as an expression of honor and gratitude for our God. And let the tithe be a reminder that God is the source of all blessings. However, the tithe should only be the beginning. Additional gifts should be given as an offering to further the kingdom of God, not grudgingly and not of necessity, but cheerfully with love. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I invite you to worship God with your tithe today. Give Him glory as the supplier of your needs. Trust Him, test Him, try Him, and give with an expectancy because Philippians 4.19 says, God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Attention all parents, the children are finishing up three weeks of lessons on creation. Starting next Sunday, they will start three weeks of lessons on Revelation. We try our best to teach God's Word from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. This particular lesson may have short scenes that may be intense for younger children, kindergarten through third grade. We want to give you as a parent the choice whether to let them participate or stay with you in service. Please see Brother Ben if you have any questions. That's all of our announcements for this week, but before we recognize our first time visitors, let's wish a happy birthday to Anita Creel on June 5th and Melinda Jenkins also June the 5th. Then we have Cheryl Daly on June the 8th and Tony Rudd on June the 11th. We want to wish a happy anniversary to Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Horton on June 7th. Thanks for watching. See you next week.
Damon has gotten the opportunity and the blessing of taking a little time with family, and um, everybody needs a little bit. All right. Let's go. How about that? All right. Let's start with prayer. Father God, we just thank you. We don't even ask you to be. Thank you. You are in the house, and that your glory resides here. And I thank you that even the people that drive past and look up on this your glory. And I thank you, Father, that as you've been speaking to me these last two weeks, prepare and present this message to your people that you've also been pre preparing the ground for seeds to be sown. Father God, I just take off the cloak of fear of man and I put on your righteousness, Father God, and I come into order and I stand under the authority of our head pastor, Damon, in his absence. And I come into your godly order that you have set forth in Scripture so that I can stand here just a servant to be a vessel filled by you and overflow in 
pour out into this place. We ask for your, a physical manifestation of your glory this morning. That when, no, when we all leave and we go out from this place, it will be known that we have been in your presence. All these things I pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Bowen Bridges, for those of you that don't know me. I'm, I'm on staff here, and this is my first opportunity to preach um, here at Hosanna, and I'm really excited about, about it this morning, but I do want to take the opportunity to share with y'all a little bit about who I am and where I come from, because I feel like even though Abby and I have been here for the last six months, we really haven't had an opportunity to share who we are, who I am. So... Um, this morning, I just want to tell you that I grew up here in Batesville. I've always lived in Batesville. And I grew up at First United Methodist Church uh, downtown here. And um, from a very early age, I had a passion for Scripture. Um, by the time I was nine years old, I was in adult Bible studies and studying Scripture line by line with explorers. And God was just impressing something on my heart um, that... I knew it was going to be used one day, but I didn't know how. About the time I was 10 years old, um, I remember sitting on the floor in my room, and I remember God calling me to be a pastor. And that scared the living daylights out of me. And I told him, you're calling, but you got the wrong number. This is not for me, and I'm going to keep on walking. And I would, I would like to make some money in my life and be in business or something like that, because that, you know, that's, where, that's, that's kind of where I want to go. So anyway... Um, time went on. I stayed in the Scripture, and I kept pouring through Scripture. He kept pouring into me. And about uh, the time I was a sophomore in college, he called again. This time, and he, he, I knew that he wanted me to go into youth ministry. And the summer, I had a Christian camp that I could go work at called Camp Ozark in Mount Ida, Arkansas. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, God. I'll make a deal with you. Never a good idea. Um, I'll make a deal with you. I'm going to go and work at this Christian camp. And if I'm supposed to go into ministry at the end of this camp, you need to let me know whether this is what I'm supposed to do, whether I'm supposed to do. This camp was pretty spectacular. Um, it had horseback riding where I worked as a wrangler. It had, you could scuba dive. It had seven wake boats. Like all of these things that you could do at this camp. And it was fantastic until the first thousand kids showed up for the first session. And that was a scary, scary time. And we rotated about a thousand kids in and out every single time. Every every week another thousand kids showed up. So I said, No, no, this is not for me. I do not want this. Okay, so I talked to God and I said, Obviously this is not what you want me to do because it's not easy. We don't want to do this. So I came back, I finished my degree at Mississippi State in marketing. And I started um, after college, I worked at Canolian in town and got married. Actually, I got married before before I graduated. Go backwards. And when, after we got married, I came back and I was sitting in uh, the church and I started listening to sermons, pastors, all of these different churches that happened to be As the pastor preached, I would hear a message. God would start to download things. It didn't really have to do with what the preacher was preaching, but it was all of these things that just beamed everything up and went so much deeper than that. And I realized that God was calling me deeper. And I realized that I was supposed to go into ministry, and I talked to a pastor friend of mine and told him what was going on. He said, Bowen, that's not normal. He said, but I'm sitting here, I said, I'm sitting here waiting on this call. He said, the desire to preach, the desire to preach was the call. See, I had all this stuff that was getting downloaded, and God revealing stuff to me, but I didn't have an outlet for it, and I was about to bust to tell people. So the desire is the call. Many of you have asked me why I haven't preached yet, or when I was going to preach, and quite frankly, um, I've been scared because since I've gotten here, I've had one message that God kept on revealing to me through day. I've been, I've been scared to preach it. And when I sat down to preach this message today, 
um, I tried to write a completely different sermon, and when I got done, I realized that God had had His way. The second thing that y'all need to know about me is that I've always felt most called to church. Um, everybody, we all have a call to the lost, and I recognize that, but I've always felt like I was called to the saints. I feel very called to revival in the church. I want the church to be a passionate, spiritual body that reaches out to the world. I want the world to love to be around the church because of the grace and goodness that overflows from it. In every congregation, I ask two questions. What is it that I can teach that flips the What is it that I can teach and reveal to people, God reveal through me, um, that lets you know that there's, that no matter what you know, there's more? And the second thing I ask is, what is holding us back? What is this thing that we have in our heads? What is this thing that we're holding on to that God is trying to get us to release to move on to something? Lastly, you need to know that I have been devastatingly hurt. If I went off on that, it would be on sermon, so I'm not going to do that. But growing up in church, I had many, many, many people into my life, like I said, just talk to Scripture and, and give me a passion and a love for Scripture. Before I graduated high school, I had done a five-year in-depth study of the early old, early history of Israel. I studied Revelation three times, line by line. Among other studies that I've done, what high school senior can say that? And God was preparing me. He was taking me through my own little seminary growing up in a United Methodist church down here in town so that I could stand up here and preach. And it was a beautiful thing that Satan hated. And so growing up in the, growing up in the church, um, Satan used somebody in the church to demean my character and cast a shadow on all that God was doing. And there was a lady in my congregation who um, started sp spreading terrible rumors about me that I was gay. And I know that sounds, I mean, we, to say that about somebody and it not be true is one of the most, you can't even imagine the pain that it caused me growing up as a 10 year old when it started. This woman was telling everyone that would listen. People that didn't know me judged me by these rumors because it felt, I, and because I felt so judged, I began holding everyone accountable to the same standard by which I was trying to live. I felt like if they could judge me, I could judge them. And then that meant that if I looked at you and I couldn't tell that you were striving for, for perfection, then I wrote you off. Because that's what I was trying to get at. I was trying to be perfect, and it was it was to the point of uh, legalism. And with everybody judging me, or feeling like everyone was judging me, and me judging everyone, I was in a really dark place. If you knew me in high school, I was, really, I was dealing with a lot of stuff then, and I had a lot of hatred for people who had hurt me in the past, and I couldn't get over it. It made me very, very bitter. It developed me so much that it became a lens through which I saw everything, and it almost made me leave the church altogether. After I graduated college, I spoke out loud that I was going to go back to church, that I was going to go on Sundays, and I was going to pay my tithe, and that was going to be my involvement with the church. God had other plans. And He sent someone that in two weeks' time became my best friend, Pastor. At the time, he was the only friend, the only best friend I'd ever had. He sent me someone that I quickly respected enough to allow him to call me on the carpet for something that I didn't let every, anyone else see. He said bitterness. One night, he did. I was dropping him off after a church league softball game, and he said, uh, Bowen, we need to talk. He said, we've been hanging out for the last two weeks, and I realized something about you. That is the Everybody that we talk about, 
there's something that you have against me, and it's starting to affect my life. It's starting to affect my family's life, and it is just something that I can't be around. And I sat there, and I said, I had to get out of my car and write him off like I had the rest of I could be broken and realize that he was right. And tell him the only words that I could bring to him. Oh, I hate him. In that moment, I am man enough to tell you that I cried like a baby. And we prayed together. And that night when we prayed, I repented of bitterness, of a spirit of bitterness and hate. And because I did that, God did something. That night, the pain started to crack and fall off of me. And I began working in the youth group of that church, and God began working in me. And about a year later, I realized that I was called into full-time ministry. And I realized that I was called to minister to the church, to re- bring reformation to the body of Christ, to call her to be who Jesus called her to be. I was called to love compassion. The very thing. One of the most important things that God has shown me through this is that the Great Commission doesn't have to Matthew twenty-eight, eighteen. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you. Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations. Nations here is the word ethnos, which means people. He just said, Go therefore and make disciples of everybody, of all people. He never said, go and make disciples of the ones that are broken in sin like you. He never said, go and make disciples of the ones um, you identified with or have compassion for. He never said, go therefore and make disciples of those who haven't hurt you in the past. This makes the Great Commission a hard pill to swallow because it means that regardless of how hurt I've been in the past, I am called to make disciples even of those who have hurt me. Even harder to swallow is that God works for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His will, right? So, what's to say that God can't take a past altercation that we have had with someone and use us as the most powerful way for the people who hurt us to see compassion and grace? God. When we allow Satan to harden our hearts towards someone, He is counting on us to keep it that way because he has no authority over us. We have to make the decision that when we get mad, we stay that way. He wants us to take this blanket and wrap ourselves in and entangle us so much that we can off the floor, but soon enough, we begin to like it. We begin to like this blanket that we've wrapped ourselves in. We don't realize how toxic it is. But it keeps us comfortable. It keeps us isolated. Away from everybody else. But not only that, you don't realize that just like a regular blanket, you have dominion. You can let it go. When we're full of hate, we have no love and compassion. We have no credibility and no wit. No one wants to be around us, and we develop a stigma. I've lived this. It's the most miserable existence in the world. And so you wonder why people don't want to hang out with you. You may have a small circle of friends that get you, but they aren't deep relationships. Most of the time, the basis of these friendships that you make are just because you hate all the same people. The 
affects everything. This hatred and bitterness affects everything. It affects everything down to the point. The thing is that you're totally justified in this bitterness and hate. Everyone you know that you tell your story to that you trust enough to let in that much tells you, oh, I'll be mad too. You do nothing but a put on the blank here. Or if I were you, I would. I've been up there with those people. They don't. They think they're better than everybody else, and you don't need them. Everyone you talk to agrees that you've been wrong. When I was in traffic, and I used to see this woman who made most of my growing up years very hard. I would get so angry. I would. And it would start to cuss it. And this spew of hatred would come out of me. I had every right to be mad. When I would tell, would tell me, I can't believe that she did that to you. And it Go to the fire, they would demean her and just throw gasoline on it. I was justified in my hatred, but only by the world. The world says that we have a right to be mad. Romans 12 1 says, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable start. And do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by a renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. When we become Christians, we have no earthly rights. We're no longer citizens here. We're citizens of heaven. Christians are to be a living sacrifice to Christ, and dead men have no rights. We are supposed to allow the world to tell us our rights. We're supposed to take from the mind of Christ. We are to be Galilean influencers. We underestimated, powered by God, and completely outside the logic of this world. That doesn't mean that we don't get mad, but it doesn't mean that we don't. It means that our worldly right to be mad is trumped by the goals of our God and His kingdom. So imagine this scenario. I said before that Satan is counting on us to get mad and stay mad. To stay bitter and keep a hardened heart. But what if we didn't? What if we just didn't? And I know that's way harder than just saying it. But what if after months and years of hating someone, we gave it to God and we truly forgave them? about the surface level stuff where you're walking through the grocery store and you see somebody one of these people that you've held this good in the store and you see it with, with your full sh- shopping cart full of groceries and you turn and walk the other way so you don't have to talk to them? Because we've done that. Um, I'm talking about actually loving people. I'm talking about actually having compassion for people. You know what it was for me? When I was, I started when I was in that car, and I would see this person in traffic. Instead of cussing at her, I started. And I began to pray for her. And I began to pray for her children. And I began to pray for her husband. And I began to pray for her salvation. And she was in a pew, but the fruit wasn't there. And I began to pray that her babies would be. Well, I began to pray for her with compassion. And I would, I, at times I've teared up over Lord. Fill up her house with your presence so much that it is seeable for, the, for miles and miles that she would be the testimony of your good. I'll, I'll also be honest because I have to tell this part too. I had a rubber band around my wrist, and if I didn't pray fast enough, I would pop myself, because sometimes we need a little extra help. I did pray for her, and I can tell you that 
We're not best friends by any stretch of the imagination. We feel very awkward when we love her. Because I love her. She hasn't developed a compassion for me. But that's okay. Because what's the most important thing is that now, if she needed help, I could help her. And I, would, I could do it without bitterness in my heart against her. And I can be a vessel that God can use to work in her life, whereas I couldn't before. Because I was so wrapped up in this hatred that God couldn't even use me because I wouldn't let Him. John 13, 34, 35, New commandment. Love one another. I love you. We also love one of this, all we know is love for God. As we love one another and even peacefully, we are known for being disciples of Christ. If that doesn't motivate you, I want you to verse 25. Uh, 25-21. If your enemy is hungry, if he is thirsty, if he is watered, for so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward Now, this is part of a joke, and we always laugh about this verse. Coals of fire on your enemy's head. Not a but I also want to remind you of Isaiah's experience. It was taken up into the throne room of God. And as soon as he got there, he realized that he was impure and perfect. And that he could not stand in the presence of God and he was done. And an angel flew up and grabbed a fiery coal from the altar and brought it back down and touched his eyes. He the love and compassion that for people to purify their heart and save their soul. Just like that fiery coal. Now I want to talk to you about a Pharisee. Pharisee of the well known who came to He hunted down the disciples like animals. Peter would have he wanted to end the movement of Jesus Christ altogether, and he did so quite brutally. But one day he had an encounter with God that radically opened his blinded eyes, and God changed his name to Paul. When Paul attempted to join the disciples professing a newfound faith in Jesus Christ, the disciples wouldn't believe him. And they said, you're the one that's been chasing after us, and you're the one that's been kill, uh, trying to kill us, and we don't want anything to do with you. They wouldn't let him in. It was by the testimony of Barnabas that they finally realized that Paul was a saint for the great. I want us to think for a minute about what would have happened if the disciples told Paul, you've got to go somewhere else because you're not going to with us. I want to ask you what we would have lost if the disciples would have told Paul, keep on trucking, we don't. Think about the writings and the things that we hold ourselves accountable to because Paul wrote them. Now, I also want to tell you that we can say, well, Paul could have gone and started his own movement with, with Jesus and all of that. They could have been two separate groups. But the problem with that is that iron sharpens iron. And Paul needed the disciples in the church just as much as the disciples in the church needed Paul. Paul wouldn't have been who he was. If he had not had the sharpening of his gifts through the disciples and the testimony of Jesus. 
message I've been told to If we want to grow in God and the Spirit to move through Hosanna, then we have got to not just open the doors to all people, to every tribe and nation, but we have to go to them and go to every tribe and nation. We cannot just be a place for broken people who are broken like us. We must become a place for all the broken people, even the ones who don't know they're broken, and the ones who are broken and don't act like it. We're called to them too. Even the ones who lash out at us and call us names. We don't get to decide who is welcome here because everyone on this planet was created in the image of God. We're called to the ones who hurt us most, hate us most, and pray, pray for them and welcome them into the fold of God. Not like we wish they were, but how they are. We are called to be fishers of men. That doesn't mean they're clean when they come out of the pond. God cleans them when we catch them. We ask God to move and do His work here at Hosanna, and we say that we humble ourselves. But what if God is doing something in someone who hurt you and persecuted you? of your life, and he's bringing him or her here to Hosanna to eventually be a leader. Do we have enough grace for that? God moving in Hosanna means bringing leaders with strong gifts of administration into the congregation to co-labor for the kingdom of God, but it knocks you out of your position and into another. Do we still want God to come and move and have his way with us? Are we good with God doing new things? Do we have enough mercy for that? Mercies are new. Jesus used Galilean fishermen to spread the word. He also used highly, a highly educated Pharisee in the wealthy Joseph of Arimathea, without which there wouldn't have been a stone to roll person has a role to play in his kingdom. None is greater and none is less. We are the body of Christ. Who are we to say that we are the hands and don't need feet or the eyes and don't need a nose? We need every gifting and every anointing to be the perfect and powerful body of Christ. One thing that I've heard since I got to Hosanna is Hosanna has a I need to say something and share something with you. Was it baseball first? I was active in that congregation by the time I was nine years old. I had a master's degree. I was involved with multiple denominations and multiple churches in this community, including Hosanna. Not only here, but in baseball, but out in the baseball area in Oxford. Nowhere I've heard more about this. I'll tell you why I think that is. Because we are a house of broken people. Somewhere we got broken. And somewhere we got hurt. We came up to Hosanna and we found a place that we could be accepted like we are. Praise God. But the problem is, we never let Jesus fill those broken places. And we're holding bitterness in our heart against the one. Where there's still a Somewhere right along the way, we decided that we would rather be accepted by people. And what I mean by that is that we wanted so bad to be accepted that we forgot that the role of a disciple of Jesus Christ is to influence people from the, for the kingdom of God regardless of whether. So we've gotten comfortable 
because we finally found this place that we can be ignore and be consequent on. But we can't be here and still have a fear of man to go out there. Damon has talked about the mentality of, oh, that I can just get inside the tent, the, the gate of heaven, and be a, have a tent on the outskirts of heaven. I need to ask you something. Everyone in every other church in town believes that the call that they believe on the of Jesus their righteousness is God's and they believe that they will receive a mansion in heaven as it is written in Scripture. How do we, professing the same faith in the same God who calls us joint heirs to the throne, kings and kings, even conceive that Jesus will give us anything? We're not less than. We're everything that God calls His children. I've heard people apologize to visitors for the way we worship. If we have to apologize for the way we worship, we need to stop apologizing and change it. I've heard people say, well, so-and-so in town treated me differently after they found out that I went to Hosanna. But my question there is, did you submit to it or did you put your shoulders back because you have a place to, tell, to say who you are in Christ. They do not. People have been shocked that somebody from a United Methodist church up at Hosan. I've had people in town come up to me and say, Hosan? Yes, I am. I've had people here ask me how a United Methodist ended up at Hosan. Quite frankly, I find very funny because the charismatic movement to the United States and helped found the Pentecostal church. But I, I just find it humorous, but that's a whole other story. Do you know what I ask people and how I respond to people when they ask me how I ended up at Hosanna? The first thing I tell them is that God called me to be here, so why would I be anywhere else? The second thing that I ask them when I realize that they're shocked is I say, I can tell that you're shocked by the fact that I'm at Hosanna. What was your experience like when you attended one of our services? Usually, I get stuttering. Wrong. I want, there are people that talk about Hosanna. You know that. That's evident. But here's the thing. Talk about us any more than they talk about legalism, the United Methodist Free Presbyterian's predestination, the Church of Christ, we see, Pentecostal's charisma, the Catholics praying to stand. We're just one in the bucket. The way that we worship God is nothing to be ashamed of, it is part of our faith identity. Just like all of those things are part of the genetics of those expressions of faith. They're worshiping God the way they see fit and the way they interpret Scripture and so are we. Everyone that I know we need to have the same ourselves. From the experience that I can tell you that this is the is not that we know that we're broken, most Christians know that they're broken. Is that for some reason, here, we're more willing to make ourselves vulnerable for our broken people. We as a church have to take another step. We're going to be just confess that we are broken. We've got to be brave enough to forgive those that are breaking. Move past it and on to kingdom business. It's so 
really bitter. We can't. Hosanna does a lot. We have a food pantry that is massive. We have one of the first things that I noticed about this congregation, different from the places I come from, is that ministry is messy. I mean that in the best way. Everybody is transparent about where they are, and it's a really beautiful thing. Um, Fuller Seminary in California contacted me a couple of about being part of a group of pastors getting together and talking about the different things going on trying to figure out how to do church This one takes about 20 pastors to be awesome. awesome. Part of it. I told them that I had moved to Hosanna um, since the talk last, and I began telling them about the dynamics of Or the church, full with the size of pastoral staff that dealing with dynamic group and all of the things that we they couldn't believe that a church like Hosanna exists. Now, understand that Fuller Seminary is an interdenominational seminary that deals with all over the world. And most of them are much bigger than. And they were amazed at what's going on on top of it. There is a problem. When Hosanna started growing in the beginning, we were in the community. We were doing things, loving on people of every tribe, nation, and and I know this because although I wasn't here in this congregation, Barthold and I were on the same baseball team, and I got to see firsthand the startup of Hosanna. And it was awesome. Hosanna was everywhere. But somewhere along the way, we let our hurts bog us down. We tried and got tired, and we. In your program. So far, we have not gone off this hill and that's people on We have not gone into all the world. We have a fear of rejection driven by a spirit of bitterness. We've come into agreement with For Hosanna to take the next step, we've got to forgive those who have hurt us. Go into the world and love them. We have to move out of the church and back into the community. It can't be a staff-driven movement. It's got to be something that the congregation stands and agrees in. Nothing that any of our staff does is going to move one inch. We group together and go hand out water bottles at the ballpark. I hate to tell you, school's going to be starting soon. Do a uh, school supply drive. Not just for our kids, but for the whole community. Think about different groups that we can minister to. It's summertime now. There's kids that don't have lunch, they don't have food. There's so much that we can do in this community. Brother Damon preached it. Into the broken. And that excited us because we identify with them. He's Jesus went out and was about his father's business, sometimes even being in the presence of those he knew were judging them and plotting to kill him. We can't make the Great Commission conditional. And decide who it is that God meant for us to go to. We have to get off this hill and go. Jesus didn't say, create a great worship service and be prepared because I'm going to send you people to ministry. We have to change our mindsets about people. I am often very intimidated. I was intimidated to get up in front of God This is what I've realized. And I've gone all over this country. Brother Damon told you I showed horses. I still show horses. I've gone all over this country. 
successful people. I don't get intimidated out there. I get intimidated at home where people know me, know my past, know what I've gone through. Um, but I realized something the other day. I'm not here to impress anyone. I'm here to influence people. For the kingdom of God, just simply by loving them. I'm not out to change anybody. I'm not to show them Christ in me so they want Christ in them. I can do the change. I can't do that if I'm allowing fear or past hurts or bitterness to keep me from building and developing godly relationships. There's so much ministry to be done in this. We're talking about some things at church. World mapping. And I looked at Brother Damon. Most churches, I would say, that that would be accurate. The whole world up there. This is our mission. Hosanna. We really need a map of the whole account. We're more local and more specific. People, everyone you come in contact with. If you end up coming overseas, then that's your that's your ministry field. So by all means, we live. Oh. I'm going to close this here. All is that as I'm praying, if God is calling you to pray, and up like God minutes, like a physical, where you're 